touch on something that Sarah Flounders mentioned, which is that uh, today in the General Assembly, the representative of my country, Canada, is raising or has raised a resolution which is not about human rights. It's not about uh, the people of Syria. It's a resolution meant to point fingers and to vilify the governments of Syria and Russia. And this resolution relates to a UN Security Council resolution that was vetoed by Russia and China some days ago. That resolution pertained to another useless ceasefire in Syria, which would have no bearing on, uh, no, bring no good to the people of Syria, and which follows um, a week of liberation of areas of Aleppo, which now amounts to about seven, or 95 percent of areas of Aleppo that have been occupied for years by terrorist factions. So at this time, when 100,000 civilians in these areas occupied for years by terrorist factions have been liberated, the UN, uh, parties in the UN wanted to impose another ceasefire. And I, I want to remind people why these ceasefires are indeed pointless. The last ceasefire in September was from the very um, start negated by 20 main terrorist factions who declared they were not going to participate and from the very beginning violated the ceasefire over 300 times during the duration of the ceasefire. And not only these terrorist factions, while the Syrians and while the Russians um, adhered to the tenets of the ceasefire, but the American-led coalition itself violated the ceasefire by targeting Syrian army positions in Deir ez-Zor, killing at least 83 Syrian soldiers in a prolonged attack that lasted nearly one hour and which enabled ISIS to, over, to overtake that position. So this is one reason why a ceasefire is pointless at this point in time. There is no faith that any of the parties that the U.S. and Western leaders who uh, have funded these terrorists, there's no faith that they can actually control the terrorists and get them to adhere to a ceasefire. And the people of Aleppo want Aleppo to be completely freed. And I speak having been to Aleppo four times, and this is the will of people in Aleppo. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to talk about um, briefly, I've been to Syria six times since 2014, two of which were with um, international delegations and four times were independently on a visa I applied for, paid for and waited for. Um, my trips have been self-funded or fundraised and I've gone at my own risk and been able to travel freely in the country to areas I wish to travel to. I've been many times to Homs, to Malula, to Latakia, Tartus, um, Siaf, Sueda, and again, Aleppo four times. And I mention these because I think it's important people realize I have, in, wherever I've gone, I've spoken in Arabic to the people I'm speaking with. What uh, Donna, what Sarah have said, the, that the people support their army and government is absolutely true. Whatever you hear in the corporate media is the complete opposite. And on that note, what you hear in the corporate media, and I will name them, BBC, Guardian, New York Times, etc., on Aleppo is also opposite of reality. Aleppo since 2012 has been inhabited by different terrorist factions, among them al-Nusra, among them the so-called Free Syrian Army, which has committed the same heinous acts of terrorism as al-Nusra, as ISIS, as al sham as Nur al-Din al-Zinki, which beheaded a 12-year-old Palestinian child and somehow is still deemed moderate. Um, since 2012, these areas of Aleppo, which have now recently been freed, um, their occupation by these terrorist factions has meant the greater Aleppo, the 1.5 million plus population of greater Aleppo have suffered sieges, denying them food and medicine. They've suffered for years a want of electricity and water, and they've suffered daily bombardment by these terrorists of mortars, of gas canister bombs, which are improvised and made locally, of water heater bombs, which are even more powerful and can level um, floors of entire buildings, of conventional weapons like grad rockets supplied by the West, and etc. As I said, they've suffered these uh, attacks on a daily basis, and even now, because there are still Western-backed terrorists in pockets of Aleppo, there are still mortars and gas canister bombs raining down, and people are still dying in Aleppo. This is another reason why the liberation and securing of these areas is imperative, because that will actually bring peace to Aleppo. Now, um, my colleagues here mentioned uh, the nature of unity in Syria and the fact that Syrians are f see themselves first as Syrian uh, before any sect. This is an important point because our media and the Gulf media has made Syria out to be sectarian, which is something the Syrians themselves have denied. But it's something, it's a tool to make people confused. It's a tool to make people believe that it's Sunnis against Bashar al-Assad, when in fact, bear in mind that Aleppo is overwhelmingly Sunni and is with the government and is with the army and is suffering from the terrorists who declare that they are liberating the city in Syria. 
Um, other points about Aleppo are um, hospitals in Aleppo have been attacked. I'm sure you've heard in the media that hospitals have been, have been attacked. Well, this media is referring to the pockets of Aleppo that were occupied by terrorists. And they have manufactured stories, and I can give you a precise account. In April of this year, there was a hospital called the Al Quds Hospital, which in a concerted effort, all media said was attacked and targeted and badly damaged by either the Syrians or the Russians. In fact, the Russians had satellite imagery showing that this hospital was in the same shape that it was in in October 2015. No difference. Therefore, it was not attacked. Months later, The Guardian, which is a prominent British newspaper, newspaper actually said the Al-Quds hospital that it had alleged months prior to be attacked and destroyed was treating victims of so-called chemical weapons attacks. So even the media that is lying is inconsistent in their lies. But there have been hospitals attacked. Uh, I went to the Al-Dabit hospital, which is in Aleppo city. It's a maternity hospital. It was attacked on May 3rd and three women were killed. You would think this would be something raised at the UN or by so-called human rights groups, but it was not. Uh, in December 2013, the Kindi Hospital was attacked and destroyed. It was the largest and best cancer treatment hospital in the Middle East. It was destroyed by al-Nusra terrorist truck bombings. And in fact, in recent media reports on Aleppo, again alleging Syrian or Russian strikes on hospital, hospitals, Fox News actually had the audacity to use a photo of Al-Kindi Hospital and allege that this is in eastern areas of Aleppo that, and that this hospital had been attacked by Syrian or Russian strikes. This goes to show how much the media has been lying from the very beginning about Syria and continues to lie. Um, when I went to Aleppo, I spoke with the Aleppo Medical Association. They comprise 4,160 active and registered doctors. More lies in the media have said the last doctor in Aleppo, the last pediatrician in Aleppo. Of these over 4,000 doctors, 800 of them are specialists. Um, so you can see that when the media talks about Aleppo, it's talking about areas that were occupied by terrorists. And it's completely negating the suffering and the will of the Syrian people in greater Aleppo. Um, when I was in Aleppo in, uh, in July, I got a taste of some of the bombings uh, by these terrorist factions. There was an explosion about half a kilometer away at um, Hatat Baghdad, and I don't know how many people were killed that day, but it was close enough that it was a massive plume of smoke. Um, about five minutes later, an explosive bullet fired from an area occupied by terrorists landed about 15 meters away from where I was. If it had hit parked cars, I wouldn't be here speaking. Um, a day later, a good friend of mine, his mother, was killed by one such explosive bullet. So this is just a small taste uh, of what people are suffering on a daily basis. In November, uh, when I was there with a delegation of Western journalists, including from the New York Times, LA Times, BBC, etc., um, on November 3rd, there were a series of attacks throughout the day with Grad missiles, um, explosive vehicles, and other uh, explosive bullets and, and snipings. By the end of the day, 18 people, civilians, were murdered and over 200 were injured, and including critically. Um, we were at the al Razi hospital, which is one of the main hospitals, and we saw the maimed people pour in. And this was just one day of many of endless days in Aleppo. Um, on November 4th, we were at the Castello Road humanitarian crossing. This was a day that was meant to allow the people in eastern areas of Aleppo that were inhabited by terrorists to evacuate. And this was not the first time. On prior occasions, the Syrians and the Russians had opened eight humanitarian corridors to enable people to leave. These were attacked by terrorist factions heavily. Even that day on November 4th, the Castello Road crossing was attacked, twice with sh mortar shelling when we were there and five times afterwards. Clearly, there has been political will and intent by the Syrian government and its Russian allies to enable civilians to leave, to minimize any sort of loss of human life. Um, Clearly, the terrorists that declare themselves liberators of Syria do not want people to leave. They've been holding civilians hostage. And if you're following reports that are not BBC and that are not New York Times, you will see countless testimonies of civilians, of the 100,000 civilians who've been liberated the last week, saying, thank God for the Syrian Arab army that liberated us. And the terrorists were hoarding food. They were preventing us from having food. This is all documented. Also documented are that Areas in these um, areas occupied by terrorists, including a school, um, were housing chemicals used to make uh, chemical weapons. And you could see also the gas canisters that were used to make ca um, explosive gas canister bombs. In fact, even when I was in Le Ramun, we saw a factory in one of the buildings that was used to make gas canister bombs. In Le Ramun, we also saw evidence of the so-called Free Syrian Army that some people say doesn't exist anymore. 
Um, the 16th Brigades was active there. They had a cell underground, three stories below, that was perfectly intact in spite of aerial bombings above ground. And I make this point because people talk about the destruction in Aleppo as if the physical destruction matters. It's the people that the Syrian government and the Syrian people care about. And the destruction in areas occupied by terrorists occurs because the terrorists are bunkering below ground, come up above ground, fire their bombs on civilian populations, and go back below ground. So um, I just want to address a few other myths. Um, some of the myths that have been about Aleppo and Syria in general have been that the Syrian government and army are starving the population. Again, I refer to testimonies of people, even people I met with in November. I met with a family of displaced people from al halak which is north of Bustan al-Pasha, which was an area, both areas occupied by terrorists. At that time, when I met them on November 10th, he told me that they had fled along with about 40 others on no about 20 days prior, and that they had tried twice prior to flee, but they were prevented violently so from doing so by the terrorists that inhabited those areas. Um, this is the case, these are the testimonies coming out of Aleppo now. People saying, we tried to flee, they wouldn't let us, they shot at us. There are also videos showing people who did manage to flee coming under fire and the Syrian army actually protecting them, acting as human shields. So that's to say that what we've been hearing in the corporate media is not depicting an accurate uh, image of what's happening in Aleppo. The corporate media is saying that the Syrian army is attacking people and until today the corporate media is maintaining this, even though the exact opposite is true. Uh, I would ask you to follow the voices of people in Syria who, like my colleagues here said, they want you to speak the truth. They don't, they're tired of lies. They're very, aware, very well aware of the lies that our media is purporting and that our human rights groups are purporting. They want an end to the violence. They don't want this war to continue. They didn't ask for this war. But as uh, my colleagues stressed, Syria is a sovereign nation. It has the right to fight against terrorism. And we know that 101 of 193 UN member states have sent terrorists to Syria to slaughter and destroy. So Syria is fighting a war against terrorism. It's winning in Aleppo. And hopefully, hopefully either the terrorists will accept a deal to be transported out of Aleppo. Hopefully they will participate in the Musalaha, the re reconciliation, will lay down their arms, will take the amnesty offered to them by the government and which has been um, taken by thousands of former militants. And hopefully, above all, the U.S. will stop supporting terrorism and stop funding terrorism. And hopefully this new bill will take fire, will, take, uh, will, will be supported, and actually it will be impossible to fund and armed mercenaries from FSA, Ahrar al-Sham, Nuruddin Azinki, and all the colors in between because they're all the same terrorists. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eva. A very informative. Thank you very much. Um, now we are open to questions, if there are questions. The gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Christopher Ronneberg with the Norwegian newspaper Aften Posten. Uh, a question for, um, or two questions for Ms. Bartlett here. Um, as a journalist, I, I'm sure you can appreciate uh, getting other uh, impressions than empirical impressions from the ground. When you talk about the Syrian people and what the Syrian people want, how can you quantify that? Uh, do you have any independent uh, uh, surveys uh, where, where you can actually um, document that? And, and secondly, um, you talk about the corporate media, the Western media, the lies uh, and all of this. Uh, could you explain what you think might be the agenda from us in the uh, Western media and why we should lie, why the uh, international organizations on the ground should lie, why we shouldn't believe all these uh, ac absolutely uh, documentable uh, facts that we see from the ground, these hospitals being bombed, these civilians who are talking about the atrocities that they have been experiencing. Um, how can you justify calling all of us liars. Sure. Thank um, you. I mean, there are certainly honest journalists amongst the very um, compromised establishment media. Let's start with your second question. So international organizations on the ground. Tell me which ones are on the ground in Eastern Aleppo. Yeah, OK, I'll tell you, there are none. There are none. These organizations are relying on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in Coventry, UK, and which is one man. 
They're relying on compromised groups like um, the White Helmets, which let's, let's talk about the White Helmets. The White Helmets were, funded, were founded in 2013 by a British ex-military officer. They have been fa uh, funded to the tune of $100 million by the US, UK, and Europe, and other states. They purport to be rescuing civilians in eastern Aleppo and Idlib, yet no one in eastern Aleppo has heard of them. And I say no one, bearing in mind that now 95% of these areas of eastern Aleppo are liberated. The White Helmets purport to be neutral, yet they can be found um, carrying guns and standing in the dead bodies of Syrian soldiers. And uh, their video footage actually contains uh, children that have been recycled in different reports. So you can find a girl named Aya who turns up in a report in month, say, August, and she turns up in the next month in two different locations. So they are not credible. The SOHR is not credible. Unnamed activists are not credible. Once or twice, maybe, but every time, not credible. So your sources on the ground, you don't have them. Um, as for your agenda, not your, but the agenda of some corporate media, it is the agenda of regime change. How can the New York Times, I was reading it this morning, or how can Democracy Now!, which I was reading the other day, maintain until this day that this is a civil war in Syria? How can they maintain until this day that, there were that the protests were unarmed and nonviolent until, say, 2012? That is absolutely not true. How can they maintain that the Syrian government is attacking civilians in Aleppo when every person that's coming out of these areas occupied by terrorists is saying the opposite? So that's with, it, um, your with regards to your question on lying Western media. How do I quantify the support of the Syrian people? The elections. In 2014, the Syrian people held elections. The voter turnout was 88%, including people in Lebanon where I was during the, the elections in Lebanon, which were actually ran for two days, extended hours, people walking for kilometers to reach the embassy, including people who flew from their own countries like mine, which has criminally shut the Syrian embassy so that Syrian people have no rights, and including people within Syria who braved a torrent of terrorist mortars and, and missiles on election day. And yet, Voter uh, turnout rate was something like 88 percent, uh, I believe, and uh, and then the the election uh, the results were um, 78, I believe. I, I, might I think Tim Anderson gives you the opposite. Okay, I might get the turnout wrong. So the the, ter the results. 74 was the participant. 74 percent, 88. 88, 88. Was the okay. Anyway, the point <laughs> being, overwhelmingly, the people support President Assad. That's based on elections, um, based on my own travels. Okay, so it, that's subjective. But as I said, I've traveled around Syria talk with people of all faiths, all walks of life. And there are people that want change in the government. We're not pretending they don't want change. Everybody wants change. But in terms of support of the government, the point is they don't see President Assad as the problem. They see the problem as terrorism. They see elements of, 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 of problems in the, the, the system that they have there. But President Assad, they don't see as the problem. They actually overwhelmingly support him. So I'm basing it on their choice in their leader, and I'm basing it on my interactions with people in Syria and Lebanon.